Um, Tanya Justin is here uh, with us today as our first presenter. She's a senior scientist and director of the Digital Learning Research and Development um, Unit and co-PI and co-director of the National Research Center for Distance Education and Technology Advancements, or DITA. DITA? We call it data. Data? Data. data. <laughs> it sounds cooler, yeah, totally. <laughs> and that's at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And I'm going to turn it over to you and welcome and thank you so much for coming. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm guessing. Oh. I'm wondering because we're recording, I should stand right here, right? You can. I, I can. Can I? I just don't want to mess up the audio, but I like well, sort of audio, moving around. Yeah, Okay. I also wore big shoes today, and I still can barely see over the podium. So, <laughs> I mean, I was really trying. <coughs> short, uh, short, girl problems here. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, thanks for the introduction, Alex. And oh wait, I got to remember to stand here because I really wanna, <laughs> I wanna move. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about turning findings into practice. Obviously. We've had some efforts over the year at the National Research Center for Distance Ed and Technological Advancements where we've co collected some really awesome data and we have some findings. And um, what do we do with findings once we have them is they're supposed to reinform our practices. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those today. Um, just to mention, um, I didn't get a chance to get my slides up here yet, but my slides will be on my slide share. So it's just slideshare.net slash tjustin. And I also tweeted it out and I'll give them to Alex as well. So. Um, there's some details in here. Um, just know that the slides will be available. So I was thinking about what would be most useful for you all today for me to talk about because there's so much research going on and so forth. So there are a couple of things that I thought might be most useful for you all in some of the work that we're doing. And one, some of you might have heard of it as the Data Research Toolkit, which I'll talk about. This is something to help you do uh, research in your classroom or your program or at your institution. I'm also gonna share with you some of the study findings um, that we've had for some of the research that we've supported. I'm gonna to talk to you about some new research-driven uh, practices based on the findings that we have for um, some data we've been collecting over the past couple years and some recent analysis. And then I'd also like to talk about um, future partnerships with some of you as faculty, instructional support staff, program leaders, and, and institutions, and so forth. So um, just to tell you a little bit about the Data Research Center to get us um, started, we're actually fed federally funded. We received a FIPSI grant for 1.5 million to launch the National Research Center, which um, I head up and I'm PI for. And so this research center was really around that, was really how do we identify key factors in distance education? So when we talk about distance education, I used it because I love words with historical significance. We all know it's not really distance because you know I'm very engaged with my students, but um, it has meaning. And so by that, we just mean blended, online. We do research in competency-based education, hybrid, blended, whatever you want to call it these days. Um, flipped instruction, pretty much anything that's out there um, fits under our umbrella. And also the acronym DETA you know, we pronounce it data, and if you're gonna <laughs> launch a research center, that acronym just seemed much more exciting than some of the other ones that were out there. And actually Congress, like, thought it should be called that, so. Um, anyways, so when we put together and wrote the grant, we felt, um, and I had been in this field for a long time, and I remember going, I come from the communication field, I'm a social scientist, and I remember going to my first sort of uh, distance ed teaching and learning conference and going to what was supposed to be a research session, and I was like, whoa, this is not research. Like, this is not what in communication we would say research was. Um, and it's interesting because we're rolling up our sleeves, we're trying to figure out how to use technology um, in the best way possible all the time. And a lot of times we're not doing rigorous research around our practices or knowing whether they actually work or not. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to develop was this toolkit was sort of coming up with a meaningful language that could guide research for everybody in this field. Because you know, in lots of fields, um, there's discussions about what research will look like and what will it will be. But you know, even in this room, there's lots of us from different areas. You know, I'm from communication, some people are from education, some people are from the natural sciences. And so we all come with sort of different paradigmatic views of uh, what research should look like in this. 
Um, and so it was just something coming up with um, a little bit of an idea of what research um, should be in this field and, and bringing up the rigor a little. The toolkit's available on our website. So if you go to uwm.edu slash data, D-E-T-A, and click on research support, or if you just go to this URL, you can download the research toolkit. And what the research toolkit has in it is its guides to different research. So guide to experimentally designed research, guide, and I should mention this version came out late 2015. We have a new version that's drafted that I just haven't had a chance to push out yet that we're hoping to push out this year. So this version that exists now has a guide to um, experimentally designed research, survey and observational research. There's a student survey instrumentation packet in it with lots of different variables and measures um, that you can use in your courses or in your programs. There's also a code book um, because what we were really hoping to do is our goal is come up with a common language so that different institutions across the country could um, participate in a collaborative in conducting research. And when we're gonna collect data at institutions across the country, we know that can be challenging. Um, so we actually included code books. So actually how to code the data, um, all of the different survey items, um, and all of that good stuff so that we can merge different institutions' data together um, to help with some of our analysis. So that's included in the toolkit. We also, in the new toolkit, have some things coming out. So we have a guide to qualitative research. We also have a guide to design-based research and some new fun things that are in there. We also, as I'm gonna talk about, have um, refined some of the survey instruments um, through some of our research. So there'll be new versions of some of those uh, research instruments in there as well. So um, when I did this um, toolkit um, and initially, sort of said like who'd be interested and I think like 75 people signed up on a form I created so I was like well maybe 35 people will really be into this toolkit and I don't I thought that was great um, and it ends up that actually over a thousand people are interested in this toolkit it's been downloaded in every state in the US and over 25 countries so wow wasn't expecting that so anyways it's pretty helpful and we're always looking for contributions and additions and feedback, um, so please feel free to reach out to us with anything that you think would be useful. Um, you know, because a lot of us don't have PhDs or don't come from research backgrounds, it's a really um, quick way to get thinking and, and supporting some of your research efforts on your campus. So after we put out the toolkit, we actually had an RFP and we funded research at different institutions throughout the country and we also um, started um, spearheading some cross-institutional research, which I'm gonna talk about those findings here today. And again, this was all with hopes that we could collect this data and then we'd be able to share some actually research-driven practices. Um, we talk about best practices and effective practices. And you know, I designed my first online course in 2001 um, and I also studied communication technology, so I was getting a lot of my theory and evidence from that sort of area. But it's like, you know, um, you, we're just sort of trying to figure it out, right? We're asking our peers what works and what doesn't work. We're asking some national experts. Um, but, you know, we, we need more rigorous research to actually help guide our practices. And I'll talk a little bit about my research that I'm doing and actually how that fits into your efforts with Oscar. Um, so that we can have some predictive validity with our shared practices. So these are some of our institutional partners. As you'll notice, I don't see any SUNY institution on there. Hints, hints, hints. So, and there's actually more of them. Um, I think I need to like, I'm running out of place on the slides and so forth. Um, and so if you go to our website, um, you can click on research briefs. Um, some of these studies were experimentally, uh, experimentally designed site-based studies that happened at one institution. Some were at multiple institutions. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about our um, survey studies um, that we worked on to collect data from multiple institutions. All right. So the results of cross-institutional online learning research. Um, one of the things um, that we did is we developed a survey study um, but also we wanted to not just collect data from students through survey, we also as part of our federal efforts wanted to look at differences um, amongst underrepresented students. So I'm gonna talk about data for all students and then we actually did some um, analysis to ensure that it was uh, working just for underrepresented students. And in doing that, we had to figure out a way 
to not only collect survey data for different variables and measures, and I'll talk in a little bit more detail about what those were, but also we had to figure out how to collect identifying demographic information for students. The groups um, that we were concerned with were low-income, minority, first-generation, and students with disabilities. Um, you know, asking a student if they're low-income or Pell Grant eligible, it's very interesting. They don't tend to know. Funny enough, sometimes 50% of the time they don't even know what their campus ID is. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, how do you collect that data? So we came up with a system to administer surveys to students while um, in the metadata, gathering their email address, that then we were able to match their data to student information system data. So we can pull the SIS data from the Institutional Warehouse System, we match it with the survey data, and then we're able to control for those different demographic variables, but also examine them in more detail to see if there's between group differences. So we were really excited to make this happen. At first we were doing this with actually a system from the medical field called REDCap. That was a nightmare for um, those of us who do research in the social sciences. Um, and actually Qualtrics now has a new mechanism that allows us to do this. So this was really great. So first of all, we sort of had this technological infrastructure in order to make this happen. Um, and it actually, now that we've worked out the process, it's pretty easy. You know, we survey students. They complete the survey. We pull the SIS data out of the um, system and match it up and, and then do our analysis. I mean, easy peasy, right? Not so easy peasy, but it seems like it now based on what we went through before. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about one study in particular that I thought you guys would be most interested in. We have um, tons of studies, but this is one cross-institutional study that I thought you'd most be interested in based on the fact of um, everyone here is doing online um, for the most part, I hope everyone, um, or you're going in that direction. Um, you're all worried about quality in online courses and programs, correct? And you've just produced Oscar and are working with the Online Learning Consortium um, to further disseminate this. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the instrumentation that I developed. So before I was running a research center, um, I actually was um, designing online courses, helping other faculty design online courses, then developing a blended and online faculty development program and all of that good stuff. It wasn't until the last I guess four years I've been focusing just on research um, to drive practice. But so um, years ago, before there were sort of these quality indicators I, um, and services and so forth, I went out there and was trying to figure out my own. And how do we not only guide faculty and how to best design their course, but how do we give them tools to have a life cycle of evaluation before, during, and after? So we ended up, um, I developed my own checklist um, and then, uh, you know, worked uh, to improve it with my colleagues. And then I actually developed a peer handbook um, for course evaluation that departments could use to evaluate each other's courses. And then one day I was thinking like, do we even know if this works? Like we have a team of us from all different disciplines at UWM. We all teach blended online. We sort of came together. I went and found the Cal State University Chico rubric for online instruction. I think back from 2003 or something when they created that. Quality Matters wasn't even yet around when I was doing this work. Um, and then I went through and found Quality Matters and then now I've incorporated their stuff. And now the CSU Chico has now become Colt the quality learning and teaching for the entire California state system. So there's all these quality indicators out there. Continue to put them um, in our materials. And then just one day, a few years ago, I was like, but we don't even know if this actually improves student outcomes, right? Now I'm convinced on the no significant difference. Um, some of my colleagues have done research in 2002 and 2004 meta-analysis um, with the results that there's no significant difference between blended, or I'm sorry, between online and face-to-face. -face. We're not doing anyone harm by delivering online instruction. Whew, thank goodness. Um, and we all know who have been doing this, and as, of course, as a social scientist, it's about the social process. It's about what we're doing inside that box that matters than it is just about the mode comparison. So we know that this stuff matters somehow, some way, but does this actually help us increase our student outcomes? You know, because faculty will come and be like, well, why do I have to do this? Why can't I just upload 32 PowerPoints and give them three exams in the course management system? And I'm like, because that's not good, but do I actually have the evidence? And there's some evidence here and there. But what I did is I turned this actually into 
um, a student report of their perspective of the course, okay? So I took all of this information and I thought, well, I'm gonna have the students tell me about the course. Um, and so these were the different areas that I ended up um, breaking out of what I'm calling instructional characteristics. Um, and so, uh, just because the naming confusion in our field alone is so much fun. Um, but these are the instructional characteristics of the course. I think when you say these are quality indicators and students are reporting on quality indicators, you know that can make people a little uncomfortable. These are just characteristics of a course in these areas. So there's learner support, design and organization, content design and delivery, instructor interactivity, peer interactivity and assessment. These are things um, in areas that I felt um, students could report on. Oh my God, I wanna go get my research toolkit out of my purse right now because it's I just like to hold it up. So in the research toolkit, pretend it's here, it's 150 pages, I printed it off at Kinko's, it's awesome. I'll show you later. I just like whipping it out at happy hours too. Like let me show you the instrument on page 71. So anyways, um, and there's different subcategories for these areas as well. And then we had different items that we developed that had reliability, um, you know, with Chrome Backs Alpha and all of that good stuff. But we didn't just wanna know about the reliability and we had some expert validity, right? But we wanted to actually know is, what is the relationship between these different areas and student outcomes? Okay, so was there predictive validity to all of these things that we are doing? If the, we do these things, will we actually improve student learning? Will we improve their satisfaction? Will we improve academic performance? And yes, you will notice that I differentiate learning from performance. Um, and so lots of times, even in my colleagues' meta-analysis, they will say learning, but they just mean grade. I'm not sold yet that grade means learning. So, um, and I also, um, for part of my doctorate work, studied in the management field. So, um, performance and satisfaction are sort of main areas there. Is this really about learning or is it about performance? So, I call it academic performance. Um, and when we're talking about learning, it's actually perceptions of student learning. So, probably about 10 plus years ago, I developed a few instruments. Oh, by the way, I love measurement and instruments. So, if you wanna get me chatty at any point, um, those are things I like to talk about. Um, so um, we developed an instrument to measure perceptions of learning um, and to measure satisfaction with the course, the instructor, and the overall sort of experience. And then academic performance is actually the student's uh, instructor reported grade of the student that we pulled out of the student information system. So this is another hard thing about this research, right? Sometimes we can't, like you can ask a student, like what grade did you get? They're like, I don't know. It's interesting the difference between asking students the grade they think they're gonna get and the grade they're gonna get. That's some other interesting research. So we really needed to be able to match that to the survey responses and get that out of the SIS system. So anyways, that's what we were able to do. So we gathered survey data on these um, six realms um, and then we linked that survey data and we also had the outcome data which was learning and satisfaction was through the survey and then academic performance was pulled from the SIS and merged. Am I getting to data like, okay. I tried to make it not datey, and then when you start talking about it, it's like stats, data, collection, let me talk about the coding. So that's where the measures, and I should mention too that this is coming out in an article in the online learning journal at some point, so you can read it there as well. So when we first, uh, we did multiple regression analysis, and we first looked at learning as the outcome variable, with these six areas as the input variables, only two came out statistically significant. Interesting, right? Now I should mention, I'm gonna pop back here real quick. I should mention when we put all 106 items as one measure of instructional characteristics and looked at if it predicted, God, I wanna walk around, if it predicted learning, satisfaction, and academic performance, they were all statistically significant. Yeah, all of them were statistically significant. So the measure, and I love just talking about the other stuff too, the other analysis, but I don't want you to think that these areas are not important. So all of them together, again, it was a 106 item measure, statistical significance. And if you guys want, I can show you those regression tables. I just thought that might be too statsies. Yeah. All right, so we should be doing this. We should be doing all of these areas. But I wanted to know specifically, what areas should I spend most of my time on? Like, let's say, I have a faculty member who's like, hey, Tanya, I gotta teach online in a month. And I'm like, oh, we've also had those ones walked in on a Friday thinking they were gonna design their online course by Monday. <laughs> and they're like, what's a URL? And I'm like, oh no, this is not gonna go well. 
Um, but anyways, um, and so, you know, what were the areas that were of most importance? And so when we looked at learning, these were the two that came out, design and organization and instructor interactivity. Very interesting, because a lot of times design and organization, like actually having learning objectives that you wrote out, that you align your content and activities to. That's something that takes you a while to get there. Um, and so it's interesting and in how important that is. And also the instructor um, interaction with the student and how important that is. You know, you can't disappear into cyberspace faculty. You gotta, you know, hang out. The students need you. And I'll talk in a little bit more detail about the specific items that made up these measures and what that means for our practice in one second. The other outcome was satisfaction. And here we had for satisfaction, it was learner support. And the big one was there. Learner support is what your Oscar is for course information. You know, did you provide a syllabus? Did you orient the students to the courses, the course policies? Did you manage their expectations, which is a key one? And were you clear in your directions and expectations? I'll talk about that a little bit more. Super, super important. And the other thing was like, do they have access to technology and support? And are there accessibility options there for them? That's sort of the learner support. And here we have design and organization again. Do you have learning objectives? Do your activities align with your learning objectives? Are your learning objectives related to the real world? And again, I'll talk about those in a little bit more. Super, super important. And then we looked at academic performance. So let's look at these six areas and whether they predict student grade. No, none at all. Yep, none at all um, regressed on grades. So that's sort of where we're at with that. So perception of learning, perception of satisfaction, yes, we're influenced. Um, as far as actually influencing student grade, no. But there's some issues with using grade. This might get slightly statsy, but I talk about this in the discussion. One of the things that we notice is that grade actually is not a normal curve, right? Do we actually have a bell curve in our grades when we look at our norm for our classes? Any of you teach and ever look at the norm? No, it's skewed. We give out majority of Bs, um, high Bs actually. Um, I'm not just sure that's where we are. So it's actually a violation of regression analysis that you would have this uh, sort of uh, equal norm, we're skewed. So just really interesting in thinking about that. Um, I don't know, on another day I'll talk about whether I think grades even matter. Um, and so, but that's for another day, or maybe happy hour or something like that. All right, so moving on. So we know that these instructional characteristics are key. We know that when we did the entire 106 item measure that it actually predicted students' perceptions of their learning God, I want to walk around. Um, student satisfaction and also the academic performance as course reported grade. We know particularly that these three were really key to influencing student success or student outcomes, okay? And I want to talk just a little bit about um, these areas. Now also, not only did we collect 106 items of uh, Likert surveys, we also collected qualitative open-ended questions um, that we analyzed through content and thematic analysis, which was really interesting. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how that research, that qualitative research complements some of the things that we found out on the survey. And in the qualitative research, we asked them things like, what, uh, what in this course can influence your, or what can the instructor do that can influence your success? We asked them another question about, um, think of a time when you had a really good online course, what was it about that course um, that was good? And so we asked them some things like this. Because, you know, I've just found out a lot of times we can ask the, the Likert questions to make sure that we have valid and reliable measures. And I should let you know that the lowest Chromebacks Alpha we had was a 0.89. For the entire measure, the Chromebacks Alpha was a 0.99. Um, and majority of the measures were at 0.95 or above. It means they're reliable, they're good stuff um, for those of you who are not stats persons. All right, so, and then when you collect the qualitative data, it's nice for the qualitative data to give us a little bit more context about what the quantitative data means. So um, just as priorities of what we're going to do here, obviously we need to be paying attention to design and organization. And a real key was this, was making sure you have an alignment with your learning objectives. I think a lot of times it's hard to get faculty to sit down and even think about their learning objectives. 
And then, and you know, that's when I, I remember, um, and I went through this journey myself. Like I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. There's 16 chapters in the book. There will be 16 units. Um, <laughs> 2001, woohoo. Um, I've progressed since then, believe it or not. And so, you know, it's hard to sit down. And then I found Wiggins and McTeague, Backwards Design, and wow, that was so practical to help you. Like, what do you want your students to be able to do? And what evidence are they going to show you that they did it? Um, and that's really important that we are implementing those practices as faculty, but in how we support faculty as well. So we need to make sure that we have learning objectives. We need to make sure that the type of learning objectives are not those. I remember this course I took, and I got like, the syllabus, and it was like, you will understand the nature of human communication. And I'm like, what? Well, how do I measure that? <laughs> like some exam that's totally not valid or reliable, but whatever, let's go with it. That gets back to my whole problem with grades. But anyways, so you know, making sure that you're documenting those learning objectives, making sure that the learning objectives aren't just sort of that uh, comprehend like the fundamental sort of knowledge but making sure that you're tying this to real life that came up a lot in the qualitative research um, as well as some additional research that isn't in the study but will coming out later we actually did a factor analysis of the instrument and it factored out very interestingly um, and we got rid of a lot of items for the next go around and so um, you know students uh, really want things to be tied to real life. They want learning objectives about their real life, um, skills for real life. So that was a, a really interesting theme that came out there. Um, and so, let me see, yeah. So spend time on identifying the learning objectives, especially learning objectives that are pertinent to the real world experiences. The learning objectives, these were specific items that factored out. You know, the learning objectives should build upon prior knowledge, facilitate an understanding of fundamental concepts, and develop skills relevant to real world. All right, and also ensuring that the activities I mentioned are aligned with the learning objectives. And I'll say this explicitly. Years ago, I read some article at a SOTO conference in Wisconsin, and somebody in a 100 level class said these are the objectives this is how the assessment links to these objectives, and this is like the activity. You know, it's sort of the backwards design, but they put it like all in a syllabus. And it was like student satisfaction was through the roof. Um, and that's a real key piece about, um, you know, students want to know what the objectives are. They want to know what's expected of them. They want to know what evidence that they're going to have to produce. So these are things that really need to be in there. And the other th thing is the organization of this course. I almost think we spend a little bit too much time on this. But more or less, students want it to be easy to learn. It shouldn't be hard to learn because it's online. It should be just as easy for them to learn as walking into a classroom, so to speak. So easy to read, easy to navigate. You know, the material should be clear. Like it was like this clear thing kept coming up again. Clear, chunked, logical, all of that good stuff. All right. So moving on to the second area, the instructor, oh, that should be instructor interactions with students. Sorry about that, my typo. We talk about this interaction um, with students. I should tell you, when we first analyzed this data, we had interactivity as like its own realm. And we threw in peer and instructor, OK? Um, and you know what happened is that it actually came out significant negative. That interactions negatively influence students' perceptions of learning. I know, right? Look at your face. I was like, oh. We did it. We forgot a reverse coding. There's something wrong. Um, this isn't right because I've been spending years, like group work. I did a thesis on it. Like we have to work together and have project teams. So anyways, what ended up is we separated out instructor from peer items and we made those separate factors. Again, high reliability on both of them. And here we find instructor interactions with instructor, student uh, um, instructor interactions, if you want to use Moore's framework. Um, ended up being significantly positive, still students negative, okay? Um, and I didn't touch on that, but I'll touch on that one second. We found out why they were negative and what we need to do to our rubrics. I'll get to that one second. All right, so the, instruction, the interactions with students we found in the qualitative data were really important. Like, yay, chicken and gamps, I'm from the 80s. I'm glad 40 years later we're just figuring this out. Um, anyways. <laughs> Um, so this is what specifically in the qualitative data that students said that they wanted from their instructor. 
So when they asked what practices of their instructor could help them, it was very clear. Clear expectations. I mean, clear was just something over and over. It was a theme we saw in the quantitative or in the qualitative, and it was a theme that we saw come up in the factor analysis that we did. Responding to email in a timely manner, or just responding in a timely manner. Um, they also really liked reminders, frequent reminders, and, and that sort of support. They wanted to be offered feedback, and they wanted to be engaged in regular student-to-instructor interaction. They wanted instructors to facilitate peer interaction, um, not just say, go get to know each other. Um, and at the end of the day, it was uh, when we talk about learner support, it was sort of what I was mentioning before. So the course should be easy. That's a whole thing around learner support. Manage student expectations about their activities, about their performance, and about grading. Make it clear. We had lots of comments about students like the activities didn't make any sense. They didn't help me achieve the learning outcomes. I mean, wow, those students are so smart. I mean, you can't pull one off on them anymore. They're like, wait, these activities didn't lead up to these outcomes. Um, and so they want to know, you know, what they're doing is going to help them produce that outcomes. And they've commented about the fact that the outcomes didn't align, that the grading was skewed, it wasn't fair, that the, uh, you know, expectations of, of workload did not accumulate to the grading and assessment scheme. So just things to uh, be thinking about there. All right, so back to peer interaction, because I know you guys are dying to know. So I, I mean, I was devastated. Like, oh my gosh, I've been trying to tell these teacher-centered sages on the stage forever that students need to be talking to each other, and maybe I was wrong. Um, and so what I started to do was a factor analysis and do sort of an item by item of analysis of what was making up this peer-to-peer -peer, um, item. Um, and what we found out in the factor analysis, because these four or five items came in a factor of their own, which ended up being this peer interaction, they were all items that focused on ice-breaking activities. I mean, but we've been doing these forever, right? Students need to get to know each other, so we're going to have a social forum. Maybe they'll go in it, maybe they won't. We're going to have them do introductions. Um, we're going to have them do icebreakers with their groups. It was sort of these superficial peer interactions, which are what students obviously did not feel was having a positive impact on their learning. However, students talked about in the qualitative findings and also some of the other peer items factored into new measures in a rich experience. There's a new measure I'll come up with someday called richness and clarity. Um, but the richness one was richness of interactions with instructor, richness of interactions with peers, richness of materials. It's like Daft and Langle, 1986, media richness theory, if you're bored. I mean, they might have had it right in the 80s, and I've used that theory to guide a lot of my instructional design. But doing this factor analysis on this, I was like, oh, wow, they totally were right. Um, but anyway, so they want meaningful peer interaction. Um, and they want the instructor to facilitate that peer interaction. They don't want to just be told, like, get to know each other and go do a project. Um, although, um, if it's related to real life, then yes, go do a project. So, you know, we just can't have students thrown in groups and, um, and expect them to facilitate it on their own and, and these superficial things. You could still do it. It's just probably not as meaningful as spending some time and, and really being in a meaningful discussion with these students. Yeah. Just a really quick one. Okay. No, sure. What do you mean by real life? Can you use this? Oh, yeah. Chris, you got to turn it on. Yeah. So what do you mean by real life? Are you talking like an internship or? No, real life is just like experiences. Like how does your course relate to what they're going to do in their real job or in their real life? So, um, you know, for example, I could have my students memorize the five theories of decision making in my organizational communication class. Or I could give them a simulation about how using one of these theories actually could improve their performance in the workplace or something like that, you know. So we could have them read all of, and I mean, I love theory, so believe me, there were times I made them read those five theories. But then I actually created like a group project where they actually were given a dilemma and they had to choose one of these theories to come up with a solution or something like that. And they're hard to do. It's hard to come up sometimes with real life activities. I'm lucky because I teach human communication and technology, and I teach organizational communication, so usually this is somehow relating to someone's job. But 
Um, a really good book is the Michelson, um, Fink, Lee Fink. There's a few of them, team-based learning. There's some good examples in that one. So anyways, more or less, students just want to know when they're teaching whatever course it is, it's somehow going to influence their future career when they get out of here. Like, what skills are they building that are going to help them in life? I know it's harder for some of us than the others. Um, but that's really what they're, they're looking for. All right, so meaningful peer interaction. Um, another thing which was interesting because we spend so much time focusing on content, right? I'm going to um, spend, oh, oh my gosh, stories I could talk about content. Like when they came out with um, voiceover PowerPoints in 2007, I was like, oh, I'm totally going to make these audio lectures. This is going to be awesome. First of all, it took forever. I am not charming while talking to a computer either. <laughs> like, hi, welcome to today's class, blah, blah, blah. I'm listening like, ah, this is awful. Um, it took a really long time. And then I um, surveyed my students about it and measured it. And then I was like, oh, they don't even like these. That was great. Fantastic. They'd rather print it up. Um, but when we were talking about content, what, uh, some themes that came out of not only this study but other studies, and I just thought I'd mention it because we spend so much time on content, um, is we do have some research that shows that obviously students perform better if you use OER. Um, they get better grades, and, um, and this was actually an experimental design with one course using an open text and one course not in a Psychology 100 class. Um, we also have done other research on OER um, and actually have seen that in the qualitative data that we gathered and that students like rich and current materials. Now, I'm not saying they want to hear you for 50 minutes do a voiceover PowerPoint about the five theories of decision making. Um, but what they do want is real life content that's out there, um, OER that you can curate and bring into your class. Um, and they also want the content to, again, relate to the real world. So they're like, let's get out of the textbook um, and out of PowerPoints, and let's get into the real world. So they want somehow for us to be tying texts um, and tying um, our uh, presentations to real world activities somehow. And then also they want context. So they don't want to just be given content. Um, they want some context about what's important about this content, how will it help them achieve their learning objectives. Again, we're seeing that. So that was really interesting as well. So when we're thinking about content, it's not spending the time making the voiceover PowerPoints per se. Um, it's going out and finding rich and current content that's interactive. That was a word that students used a lot to describe their content. Um, and that's free for them to use. And I know that's a hard lift, you all. I know that is a hard lift to make that happen. Uh, but we need to be thinking about that. Um, and we need to provide context. You know, one of the things after I was devastated that my students didn't like over the top love my voiceover PowerPoints that I spent like an entire summer making, um, and probably not till the sixth one did I realize I had to be like fake entertaining talking to my laptop while I recorded it. Um, I went on and found out, oh, it wasn't really the fact that they needed a voiceover PowerPoint. It's the fact that they needed that context. So I started doing like little audio intros like, hey, it's Tanya. This week we're working on this. You're reading this, blah, blah, blah. The other thing I found out about text and different things is they love annotation. And that gets back to that richness again. So when you are providing them with a PDF or something like that, are you putting in links to extra materials? Are you annotating what's important and adding your comments? Um, that was another study that we did back in 2013. So anyways, I just wanted to touch on the content stuff because I know we spend a lot of time with it. But it's really about, um, and, you know, and Moore and Kearsley said this in 2011, and this comes out of, I think, Moore's research from earlier than that. But it's, think of your content as not a dissemination tool. Like, I'm creating content to disseminate knowledge onto my students. Think that you are creating an interaction between your student and content. That's what you're doing. You are creating and facilitating a student to content interaction. And I think if you can frame it in that way, oh, again, I'm walking away from the mic. You can frame it in that way. It's just like a different mindset that will better help you, um, you know, give the students the experience that they need. All right. So um, just remembering, too, students really want clarity or ease of learning. So everything needs to be very clear, very explicit, map it all out, write it all down. And the other thing is they want a greater richness, richness of interaction with the media, with the tools, with the technology, with you, and with other students. OK? Any questions about the research before I jump and do a, a couple other things? 
Yes. Sorry. Did it depend on the types of classes that you were studying, whether yep. it was a communications class versus a yeah. calculus class? In this study, we did not look at between um, discipline um, differences. So we did not do a MANOVA analysis to look at the different, uh, different disciplines. It would probably be even harder to look at different classes because we have multiple institutions. Um, so this is actually findings across all four disciplines and across all classes and all course levels. Yeah, and there are descriptive um, information about what made up that, um, the different disciplines and courses and so forth. So it'll be in the article if you're interested, drop me an email. But yeah, um, I know in previous studies we have found differences, obviously, between social sciences, arts and humanities, natural sciences, and the professions, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. What tool did you use to analyze the qualitative result? Qualitative data was done by hand. Yeah. yeah. We are old school. I actually even still like to print it out sometimes. Um, but I don't do the qualitative analysis. I have two um, PhDs that do the analysis. One's from psychology and one's from, uh, actually a, a rhetorician from communication. Yep. Yep. You mentioned several times um, about grades and the possible lack of value they might have. Um, yeah. Does your research look more closely at assessment design, the role of grades, and um, how they reverse engineer the way a course actually functions? Nope. But if you find someone to fund that, I'll be more than happy to do that. Before I was at the university, I did psychometric consulting and designed um, national um, exams for medical specialty boards, like heart surgeons and that sort of stuff. And so I think there's a real issue with the assessments that we give our students, especially the ones that are not authentic. And um, actually, if we actually think we're measuring what we're measuring in our exams, we're delivering at the university. I agree. Okay. Yep. Tanya, what about differences in terms of compressed academic terms versus the full term? Yeah, we didn't do that analysis. These are at, um, we do ask students about their semesters. We're just doing fall, spring, non-compressed. Okay. It was one of the things I tried to somewhat control for. You got me thinking. I just read an article that came out of University of Toronto, and it was a, it was a small-scale study, but there were distinct differences in that in the compressed term, students commented more and preferred more the peer-to-peer -peer interaction and that actually had a negative correlation then in the full term. So yeah. it was interesting the differences there structurally. One of the things, we're actually doing a similar study in competency-based education, which is an open term, but one of the interesting things is always pay attention to how they're measuring peer interactivity or peer-to-peer -peer activity. Look at the actual items in the survey or email them, because that's really important. We could say peer-to-peer -peer interactivity, but what does that mean? Um, and so you have the, the definitions of these measures mean so much to how we take the findings. All right, any other questions? I'm going to jump into the, yep. So initially in your presentation, you separated out uh, student learning and academic performance. Yes. So how did you measure student learning and did, was that correlated with any of these? Yeah, so student learning um, was perception of student learning. It's. Um, I don't know, let's say about a dozen um, Likert items with a Chromevax Alpha of maybe like a 0.97 for reliability, which asks them about, you know, did this course help you put concepts together? You know, all those sorts of uh, learning um, objective sort of words were tied into there. And yes, um, it did statistically significantly predict design and organization and insta instructor interactions with students. Both those two were in there. Did you make any attempt to look at the student navigation of the UR or the UX and their time in the environment? No. Yeah. No, but that's one of the things we want to talk about in the future. And I've been working with some folks. I really just need lots of funding. Um, but how can we take the instructional technology platform data, things like that, like frequency of entry, duration of entry, how do we merge that with the survey data and the SIS data? The IES keeps turning me down and I keep submitting grants. Uh, and I have some corporate partners, but nobody is um, ponying up the money yet. So, But that would be awesome, because then we can actually have the technological artifact data of what they're doing in the LMS. We could tie that with their perceptions of what they're doing and then with the SIS data. OK, that got really statsy nerdsy. OK. Any other questions? 
All right, so I'm talking about all of this, and this is just one study. Um, we have lots of other studies going on. So I'm just telling you about the instructional characteristics study. We have a whole other study that's on student characteristics and whether they predict student success, if there's some validity there, um, predictive validity. So we look at online skills, self-directedness, um, online efficacy, and all those fun things. Um, and we've analyzed that data, and that will be coming out. Another study we're doing is on academic and social involvement. You guys might call it engagement, but wow, that room has got, that word so convoluted. So I went back to what Aston and Pace called it in the 80s, and that was academic and social involvement. Um, and so we're doing that study as well, um, very similar research design model. We're also doing studies of competency-based education. So we're looking at the instructional characteristics of CBE and how that influences student outcomes. We're not quite sure how to measure student outcomes yet in CBE, but we're figuring it out. <laughs> Um, and then also we are looking at the perceptions of learner support. Um, one of the other studies that we're doing that Alex and I were talking about in detail is our um, coaching study. So we did um, coaching is a very um, specific role in competency-based education. It's like one-stop shopping for one person for all of your support and your experience, whether it's advising support, uh, tutoring or academic support, or just institutional support, like how to register. It's just one person. Um, and so we've been doing interviews, and we're analyzing that data right now, and we're looking for um, a couple secondary pieces of that. But one of the things that we don't have a lot of data on, now that I'm doing this data on instruction, is do our student support services statistically significantly positively influence student outcomes? Um, and so we're developing a research model for that right now, and we're looking for institutional partners and funding um, to help better understand that. We've sort of thought of this as a uh, mixed methods where we would have, uh, we would collect data from technology platforms, institutionally warehouse platforms, but also do student surveys and potentially focus groups and interviews with staff, students, and faculty to better understand, um, you know, this, that's so sort of, you know, foggy. So that's just some of the research um, that we're uh, working on that we are looking for partnerships. I know SUNY, somebody here wants to be a partner. Um, and so those are uh, things that we're looking for your students to participate in these studies, you to participate in them. If you go on our website and um, click on under news, like um, I wanna be an institutional partner, it has some details to some of the studies. The Another one that we're doing is actually we're working with a few groups. Of course, we're in context, and we're working with um, McGraw-Hill um, and starting to develop what's called an implementation study. So, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Rogers' diffusion of innovations, um, and so uh, lots of times we're like, how do we implement technology, or how do we implement a new mode of learning, and we don't quite know how, and we spend a lot of money on it. And so one of the other studies we're working on is a mixed methodological approach to studying implementation of technology um, in higher ed. So um, fun things. I should mention that we recently took the Oscar framework <clears throat> and we uh, are editing our instructional characteristics instrument to ensure that we're taking into account um, all of those items. So future surveys um, would have those, um, um, those indicators in it as well. So that's super interesting. I'd like to do a reverse of that too yep. to see if there's anything. Yeah. You got to hold it. I Is think. it on? I turned it on. You have to hold it with your finger the whole time, don't you? No, I don't think. Oh, so. okay. Um, but anyway, I, I want to do the reverse too um, yeah. to make sure that the stuff that you have identified is, is represented in Oscar, and that would be an interesting analysis just to yeah. to see, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one of the other things as an executive board member of this quick courseware in context, I'm not sure if you guys have heard about this, but it's supposed to help uh, folks in identifying, selecting, and adopting technology and their courses and programs. Um, so as the executive, uh, a member of the executive committee, one of the new things that I did is they have something called um, course level and implementation, or course level and institutional level implementation guides. We're actually changing Separating that out, there's going to be some revisions coming down in the next few months, but we've created new course level indicators and program level indicators, and I've incorporated not only our research, but um, the work from Oscar as well um, in these new course level and program level indicators that will be coming out later this year. Um, and there's also a new implementation guide. It all just is um, in draft form as of uh, last week. And I'm meeting with them this afternoon to talk about it. There's also a new implementation guide that will be included that helps you 
um, walk through the steps of um, technology adoption. So hopefully that will help you as well. All right, any questions? Yeah. Sorry. So as I'm like, you stay there, I'll, I'll stay, here. stay here. Okay. Um, so we talk about implementation. One of the things that we have, um, we, we've over the past few years got this tremendous data store now of, of student activity and student um, issues with our early alert, early alert systems and uh, predictive analytics projects we're working on. Um, but we seem to be having, and when you said implementation, it really just struck a bell because we have this problem of going from research to practice, right? Mm -hmm. And trying to find, you know, we look at the data and go, well, that's great. What do we do with it? Um, is there any work that you've been doing as far as taking that and, and doing analysis of uh, some of the interventions um, that you've been, you know, taking the information, applying an intervention to that, and then analyzing the intervention success based on the data that you've gotten? Yeah, there is some research that we're doing. Are you talking about specifically the data that you're getting from learning analytic boards? Uh, okay, so one of my colleagues are working on a, um, actually my co-PI, Diane Reddy and, and Dylan Barth, some of you might um, be familiar with them. Um, they're working on a study, and Diane's been doing this for a while, but like for example, um, developing nudges based off the learning analytics in the LMS and then the nudges influencing the students and then doing data about whether that influences their outcome. And actually McGraw-Hill is doing some similar data as well. When you talk about intervention, that's really a hard thing. Um, this research actually helps us look at the course as a whole. When you're talking about intervention and experimental design, it's really hard because it's like, you know, in the fall semester, do you have two instructors teaching the same course? One's using the intervention, one's not. Very hard to do that. Um, and, and even with that, it's like in the fall semester, are you, are you only changing that one thing? Are you only changing the fact that you have an intervention, which is nudges or something, and then looking at how that influences grade? You know, and the ethics of it, too. Oh, I'm going to slow down there. But, you know, um, so it can be hard to isolate whether it was just that one intervention and the fidelity of, you know, the, the fidelity of the practice of that. Was it implemented in a way that was meant to be to hit that outcome? We definitely should be doing that research. Um, but that's a whole nother thing. How do we use the data that we get out of analytic systems to inform practice? This is empirical data that we're mm -hmm. using and in informing practice, but how do we use that data and then how do we study it beyond there? Yeah. I, I think it's critical because- I think people are still trying to figure out what the interventions are, what to do with the data that they're getting um, out of some of those um, bigger systems like um, Student Success Collaborative and and all of that. Well, I think, and one faculty member put it real well to us and said, okay, so now we know all this. Yeah. And if we don't do anything about it, are we culpable for that student's yeah. <laughs> tuition? Because well, other, we knew they were going to fail. Yeah. The other thing is, do you have the right people at the table? So a lot of times you have data people trying to interpret data that have no context. You know, like I have a researcher. Um, she's a quantitative researcher. She knows nothing about education. So when she sees the findings, it's very different than when I interpret the right. findings. Um, so you have to have, you know, the right stakeholders at the table looking over that data. Do you have the advisors? Do you have a student to give you the opinion of the student perspective? You know, do you have the faculty member? Making sure in the beginning that you have the right stakeholders at the table to discuss this. But I think just knowing that you have to do something about it. But there are ethical things, like mm -hmm. not giving an intervention when they needed an intervention or giving... Um, you know, whether just in the situation you're talking about or randomized controlled trials. So, sorry we got off there. Any other questions? Yeah, Peter. I, thanks for sharing this. It was a very rich presentation with a lot of interesting variables and contexts and high quality data. Um, one of the questions I had, it seems like this is uh, a lot of these constructs are reflective of certain theoretical framings, and I'm wondering how you feel like the research that you're doing now contributes to theory development or theory testing. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because a lot of these constructs um, do not necessarily are informed by theory. 
they are informed by quasi-Delphi methods or by anecdote or by qualitative data informed these constructs hmm. in the areas. So, I think later there were some theories that came out, but I think in the beginning it was a grounded approach to theory. Uh -huh. yeah, um, so. And so I think that these could inform in the fact that future theory could be developed in these areas and it's actually been tested or falsifiable yeah. and all of that good stuff. It, se it seems like you've developed a, a lengthy survey with 106 mm -hmm. items and that there's uh, assumed within those item sets, there's theories of learning. Uh, for yeah. example, there's a dozen questions on yeah. learning that reflect assumptions about what learning is. I think each construct has its own area of research and yeah. theory. Yeah. It'll, be inter it'll be interesting to see how this contributes to theory development, I think, because there's a lot, I think there's a lot of opportunity to tease that out. So. Yeah, and I mean, the overarching theory, if we're thinking about meta theory, is more a systems theory approach, and I talk about it in the toolkit. Um, and taking a more systems um, theoretical approach to the research design in the fact that we're trying to not only understand inputs and, and move beyond this mode comparison, but also looking at the process variables and the outputs. Um, a lot of times we see just an examination of the process, like a qualitative analysis of what happens in a discussion. Um, maybe in one class or a few classes, we'll see what happens in a discussion linked to the output variables. Um, but because we haven't been able to merge this data from all the different sources, like get the demographic data from the SIS, um, link it to the instructional technology platform data, or at least students' perspectives of what's going on, and link it to the outcome data, our research has been hindered. So mm. we need to start moving more towards, or at least that's the argument I make, mm. and we, I call it the framework of inquiry for distance ed, but mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, there's two different pieces that I pick up. One, I'd like to understand better how you're using the Qualtrics metadata feature. I to, know, it's to, so I, awesome. I want to do that. Yes. <laughs> so I, I actually awesome. sent you an email on that already, so I'll skip that question. The other one was about the disconnect between students' perceptions of peer interactions and instructor interactions. We did a, yeah. a study a bunch of years ago where we were testing ideas around the notion of teaching presence and, and looking at student perceptions of the quality of the instructor's uh, facilitation of discourse, you know, d design of instruction and direct uh, in instruction. And we created parallel sets of With items. Karen? I think I quoted in that Yeah, we, yeah. we created parallel sets of items to ask when the instructor did these things, you know, how well did they do them? And then we had a parallel set of items that said, when s your fellow students do these things, how well do you rate them? And then we correlated those with reported learning and satisfaction. And the correlation between reported learning was twice as high when the instructor was doing it than when students were doing it. So I think there's a theory-based you know, set of results that support the idea that the instructor presence, teaching presence matters more to students when it's coming from the instructor than it coming from other students. Yeah. Yep, I think I could be right. I mean, our quantitative and qualitative data was pretty clear about the importance of the instructor's role. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, and so I think also too, like there could be a whole study on academic and social involvement just related to peer interactions. I have another mm -hmm. study that actually weeds that out even um, further, actually mm -hmm. two other studies. So Thanks. yeah, that could be a good, uh, <laughs>